had relatively few cities. Uh, the area where they actually landed were just small port towns. It's not like the Philippines where you've got a Manila where potentially you could have had a big urban battle. There was, relatively speaking, little resistance because the British kept pulling back. And of course that was all the advantage of the Japanese. Ironically, the British have engineered the road so well, the Japanese advance with extra speed. Demolition tactics fail to stop the infantry on bicycles. Special construction units rush in to repair bridges for the tanks and trucks to follow. The Japanese have a, a saying, a sort of parable about themselves, particularly males. The, the symbol is the carp, and the carp swims upstream against all obstacles. If it's an obstacle, he just keeps trying, trying. I think there was a carp-like quality to the Japanese advance in Malaya. Meet an obstacle, fight it. Uh, if the British are blowing things up, bring in Korean laborers or whoever to reconstruct the roads at night and then move your troops along rapidly as you can. Just keep going. That was one of the things, I think, which surprised the British, the, the intensity and the determination with which the Japanese continued this advance. The Japanese battle plan calls for victory in 100 days. But in less than 30 days, the Japanese push the British halfway down the coast of Malaya. By January 7th, the front lines are within 250 miles of Singapore. The individual Japanese soldier certainly would have had a certain degree of apprehension about going up against the British, even though there's propaganda about how the colonialists are corrupt and weak. But then to see this thing succeed, to have it go as well as it did, as fast as it did, uh, would have been amazing. There would have been a sense of elation, as well as a sense, always remember, this is battle. The speed of the Japanese advance catches the British completely off guard. English regiments are in disarray. Untrained in jungle warfare, they are ordered to delay the Japanese as long as possible. They must destroy anything that can be used by the enemy, and then retreat. Since British military experts believe that tank fighting in thick jungle terrain would be useless, there is not a single Allied tank in all of Malaya. That leaves no logistical way to hold off a large invading tank force. We moved up to uh, Adam Estate. I'd play the ammunition in two days. You know, you can't run out really, can you, if you've got adequate supplies for two days. <laughs> I'd snipe it. I'd be coconut tree, you know. You saw one of my mates, best friends. Bullet straight through the forehead. I saw him up there. We shot him down. And he, he had a, a mask made out of a coconut. The Japanese constantly outflank the British lines with their skilled jungle fighting. By the end of January 1942, all hope of holding the Malay Peninsula has evaporated. The British are ordered to withdraw to the stronghold of Singapore. On January 31st, the British troops complete their withdrawal into Singapore. Behind them, the causeway connecting the island to the mainland is blown up hoping to prevent any Japanese invasion. That was uh, never going you know, to take it. Well, it's obvious, wasn't it? Like, all that naval guns they had situated on the coast. We saw about three Japanese planes while we were there. Dropped about three bombs and that was it. And they looked, I did look like old training planes, you know. No, nothing special about them. However, one of the mainstays of a defense, air power, is lacking in Singapore. They had loads of planes sent in crates. They weren't even assembled. Spitfires and Hurricanes. But they weren't assembled at all. British troops who have just arrived in Singapore are given orders to start digging defense positions. The fact that this is being done with the Japanese at their doorstep is a result of British overconfidence in their ability to hold Singapore. Singapore's defenses to the south are strong, but there's still a vulnerable opening in the north, which has never been closed. The giant guns cannot be used for protection. General Percival spreads his men along the beaches, hoping to prevent the Japanese from getting a foothold on the island. 
Only 2,500 men protect the narrowest point of the strait. Here, in small boats, 4,000 Japanese are getting ready to attack. February 8, 1942, Japanese General Yamashita decides to invade Singapore. With his supplies running out and his men outnumbered three to one, his only hope is to force the British into a quick surrender. Yamashita sees the heights in Johor, which is on the mainland of Malaysia, opposite the island of Singapore. They set fire to oil tanks, uh, the naval base. They had the artillery advantage, they could create a lot of noise, they had command of the air, they were dropping bombs, and so the spirits of the Japanese troops must have been, after this amazing, rapid uh, advance on the city, terrifically high as they prepared for the climactic moment of seizing the city itself. The Japanese send up an observation balloon to direct their artillery fire. The British have no planes to knock it down. Yamashita did that was surprising was to go around and have an amphibious force land on the western side of Singapore Island at the same time the British had planned for a different battle. The big guns, the place to protect was the naval base at Singapore, but the guns were pointing out to sea, not to the north from the direction from which the Japanese would uh, advance. And with the advantage of controlling the airfields on the Malayan mainland, continue bombing the city to disrupt morale of, of the people in the city, making them more willing to surrender. 